We have a bit of story coming next. Tony Toledo comes from the North Shore. He describes it as, well, let's see if I can find it. One massive, he lives on a massive one-tenth of an acre estate that he bought in Beverly, Massachusetts with his stories. So Tony Toledo is a storyteller. Not only is he now a storyteller and known for his stories, but recently he has taken on the job of president of Lanes, which is our local storytelling organization. And you might also see him at the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, where he might be an MC or leading a workshop. You might see him on the streets of Cambridge, perhaps sharing a story or someone's poem or his own, perhaps, on a subway. Uh, he has been sharing information of the arts, not only to, restricted to story, but poetry, song, dance, beyond. Uh, Tony honors it all and shows the great honor of being committed to it. I will tell you, I guess in Tony's bio, he felt it was important to include that he and his wife, K.R. Glickman, host an annual corn party every August. It's a block party where everyone dresses in yellow, and it's full of games. This is part of who Tony is and his great spirit in making everyone very comfortable in the art they have within, in being able to let it come shine out to the community around, whether it's very small or it's a couple of hundred somewhere at a great event. When I asked Tony what led to, what inspired him to begin telling stories, he said that he heard the storyteller Judith Black on WERS at Emerson College. She was telling about being banned in the western suburbs because she used the word bum for a baby's bottom. <laughs> and that got him going. <laughs> so, Tony, <coughs> president of Lanes, bringing stories wherever he goes, working for the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, uh, and there are many other things, good work that he does. He's at the, um, a New Year's celebration in Beverly uh, where he shares stories on New Year's Eve and he shares stories for the Project Read Boston Storymobile, bringing books, free books and stories to children across Boston. He's a very busy man and I don't think he stands still. When I asked for one of his most memorable moments sharing one of his own stories with others, Tony identified March 28th as the Lanes, League for the Advancement of New England Storytelling Organization, where he was presented with the Brother Blue and Ruth Hill Storytelling Award, and we have Ruth Hill here in the front row today, for supporting and promoting storytelling in New England. He said after he got the award, he was given the nominations and he discovered that a friend wrote about a time in 1989 when he visited her classroom. It was an English classroom. And he led a storytelling residency program with her students. And the teacher wrote, his friend who was the teacher wrote that there was one student who had not spoken out loud in class ever. To communicate, she would only write her teachers and her therapists could not get her to speak. This teacher said it was amazing when she stood up and told her story in Tony's workshop the time he did visit. It was an amazing reading about something so wonderful that happened so long ago, Tony recalls. He does good work. And when I ask, what have you learned from your work through the years as a host of many different kinds of events. Tony said that, well, he said many things, but I'll, I'll try to uh, share a little bit of uh, some of the great truth of his response. Being an open mic host means being there to serve the community. I want to draw the best out of the speakers. I model really listening. 
And he said that he also likes to introduce each person with a coin and a comment. I have my own coins. I once shared one of my, I spent one of my coins for a desperate coffee, and they were all fighting over it at Pete's. Tony gives meaningful thank yous to his community. Thank yous for sharing. He said that we are all connected. And he said, running an open mic shows that the best to him. So now we have the treat of hearing Tony share some of his own stories. Please give a round of applause, a warm welcome, Tony Toledo. Uh, yes, I am thrilled to be on the stage with you, Bob. This is great. I mean, it elevates me quite a bit when we go over here. I'm just a little old storyteller. Ruth, I want to say that I am just thrilled to be the recipient of the Brother Blue and Ruth Hill Storytelling Award. Lane's offers it once a year to somebody in the community. The thing that I thought was odd, the board presents the award. I'm the president of the board. So they had all these emails I find out later that said, do not show this to Tony. And they put out a survey monkey just for me, so I voted on the other people and they didn't put my name in it. And I thought, these are such tricky people. And then I wasn't I've been to Sharing the Fire, everyone, since 1988 when I moved here from Ohio. But this last March, I was not able to be there because my uncle had died and my aunt had asked me to go down to Georgia and give the eulogy. So he was in the Army for 20 years, so I cut my ponytail off and put a suit on to go out and give his eulogy. And then that's the year that they present me with the Brother Blue Word, the Ruth Hill Award. And I think, oh. And my friend sent a video link to me and it said, you know, snippets of Sharing the Fire. And I thought that, you know, I was over, I was in my aunt's office and I was looking at her computer and I didn't want to change, you know, I thought it would be my friends just saying, oh, we miss you, Tony, here's a fart joke for you, yeah, here we go. And so I didn't look at it until I got home. And I would even emailed our director because I was curious who had gotten the Brother Blue Ruth Hill Award because I had nominated another person and I wanted to see if she had gotten it. And the director wrote back and said, did you look at that video yet? And then I opened the video and I looked. My wife had gone to bed. I woke her up at 1 o'clock. <laughs> Honey. She goes, what? I said, no, nothing bad. They gave me the Brother Blue Ruth Hill Award. And I'm over here crying. She's going, congratulations. Time to go to bed. OK, good. <laughs> and there was a fellow from North Dakota, George Nelson. He got an award from the National Storytelling Network. And when he accepted it, he told a little story. There was a farmer who had entered his nag in the county fair at the horse race every August. And every August, she came in last. And every year, he entered her. And his friend finally said, why do you put that horse in that race? She always comes in last. He goes, I know. But she so enjoys the company of those other thoroughbreds. <laughs> and that's how I feel. With so many wonderful people have gotten this award than to have my name there. It's really great. I also think it's amazing that the better use of air comes to mind, and I think that's an elevated thing with kites and you know having fun with it. Whereas for myself, I was in Marston Mills, and I was with my wife. KR is deaf, so we do sign language and stories together. And there was a teacher. We're in the lunchroom, and she turns to her us and to her other friend and said, "Little Jimmy was passing gas all morning." And I said, "This is the sign for fart." <laughs> and the teacher turns and says, "When I was a girl." We weren't allowed to say that word. I had to say trouser cough. And the other teacher looked and said, oh, I couldn't say it either. I had to call it a fanny whisper. And that sent me in search of all the other euphemisms for passing gas. There's bookmarks in the back of the room that have all those things listed. So that's why. Now, see, I don't, you, I'm already dragging the whole thing down over here. So we're going along. And I think it's great, too. I love that you just mentioned Kevin. Kevin was a dear friend. And when I found out that he had cancer, they had said, uh, send us postcards. Just send us jokes if you can. So I said, all right. And I think my favorite one that I put in, Kevin was in the hospital, and there were six doctors around him. And they said, look at this. I can't believe it's so big. I didn't know anyone would have a funny bone this large. What? He graduated from MIT? He got a PhD? And he's got a sense of humor? I didn't know anyone there had one. <laughs> And just little things to try to spark them up. And Kevin had gone ahead. My wife did a show called Searching for My True Voice. And it was one deaf woman's story about being told when she was a little girl that you had to use a lip reading. And then as she grew up, she wanted to sign. So she wove this whole theater show. And Kevin came over, and he videoed the whole thing. He's also a professional videographer and doing all this. And he wouldn't accept payment, but he would let us buy him breakfast. 
So we went out, and it's just one of those little moments of having fun. So that said, I found a story in an old book called The Fawn and the Woodcutter's Daughter. And the story is this uh, Barbara Leone Picard had written it. And the fawn, instead of being like a fawn like we think of Bambi deer, this fawn is a, a person that's got horns on their head and they've got hooves for feet and a tail and dappled skin and fur. The fawn and the woodcutter's daughter. It was a long, long time ago in a small cottage at the edge of the wood that the woodcutter lived with his daughter and his wife. It was the girl's stepmother. And the daughter would go out with her father and he would teach her everything about the forest. He taught her where the tracks were for the deer and he taught her about the butterflies and he, he taught her about the raccoons. And she loved everything in the forest and she would wander through the forest and even when she wasn't with her father, she so enjoyed just going out into the forest to find things to explore. And one day, when she was seven, she wandered farther than usual, and she'd brought a crest of bread with her, and she put the bread out. She was deep into the forest, and she broke it up, and the birds were eating the bread, and the squirrels were coming up, and she leaned back, and it looked to all the world that she was asleep, but she was watching. And then there was this little fawn, this boy, he came up and looked. And she caught him out of the corner of her eye. And like all the wild things in the forest, he was skittish, but he saw that the birds weren't afraid of her and the squirrels weren't afraid of her. So he moved closer and she opened her eyes and said, who are you? And he said, I'm the fawn. Who are you? I'm the woodcutter's daughter. You must be one of the humans I've heard about that hurt everyone in the forest. Well, maybe some people do that, but I don't do that. Really? You sure? Yes, sit down. And the fawn sat down beside her and they started to laugh and they started to talk. And she said, do you know any games? And the fawn said, yes. And he stacked up rocks and he took one feather and put them on top and said, look, we've got to take acorns. And he tried to knock the feather off. Whoever can knock it off without knocking the pile down wins. And they were laughing. She said, oh, I've got to get home. And said her goodbyes and started walking home. But with every step, she forgot more and more. And when she arrived home, she couldn't remember what she'd done that day. And her stepmother said, where have you been? She said, I was in the forest. I had so much fun. I met someone new. New? What? Who did you meet? I, I don't remember. Well, I, it was something. I saw the birds and I saw the squirrels. And her father said, well, you always see birds and squirrels. There must be something more. And she said, there is. But I can't remember. She had her supper and then she went to bed and she spent all the time falling asleep trying to remember. And in the morning, she didn't even remember that she'd forgotten. And she went through her days and she helped her mother, her stepmother, and helped her father. And then when she was 14, she had a yearning to go out into the forest again. And she went out into the forest and she was wandering deeper into the forest. And she was there and she saw him and he started to run and she says, wait, fall! And the fawn turned and said, oh, it's you, the woodcutter's daughter. And she said, yes. And he came over and said, I remember you. And she said, I remember you. You told me that there was more people in the forest. I've never seen. And he said, yes, there's the wood nymphs. They're green and they've got their green hair and they love the dance in the moonlight. She said, I would love to see one of those sometime. And he said, maybe. And he said, it's cold, it's starting to rain, come. And they crawled into this giant log and they sat there talking. And then he said, oh, it's almost time for the sun to go down. I, I've got to go, she said. And she walked back home. But by the time she got home, she couldn't remember who she'd met. And it was a long time until she thought to go out to the forest again. It was the summer that her father died. She was 21 and she thought, I have to go wander. I wonder, but I should stay here and help my stepmother. And they were doing the mending and their money was short. And the stepmother said, if you would marry, then perhaps someone would take care of me. The cottage will be lost if we can't pay the rent. And the daughter had said, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't really want to get married, mother. She said, we'll see. And there was a man who came by and he was a linen maker. And he saw this beautiful woman in the yard and he stopped on the pretense of asking directions, but she just looked up. She smiled at him, but only her lips were smiling. 
And then he talked to the stepmother and asked and found that she was not engaged to anyone. And he came back the next day and said, will you marry me? And she said, no. She didn't know why she didn't want to marry him, but she said no. And the stepmother had talked to her later and said, he told me he would give me gold to pay for the cottage. You've got to marry him so I can stay here. But if I marry him, I'll have to go into town. I'll never see the forest again. Do it for me. And she said, all right. And when he came back again, she agreed to marry him. And the date for the wedding was set. But the night before the wedding, she said, I've got to go into the forest. And she grabbed her bucket and told her stepmother, I need to go to the well and get water. But then she ran into the forest. And she found him there, the fawn. And he said, oh, the wood nymphs are going to dance. And she danced with them. And she said, I've got to go home, but I never remember you when I'm not here. I need something just to bring with me. And the fawn said, I'll always remember you. Here, take this. And he pulled three hairs from his head. And he wove them into a ring that was almost invisible and put it on her finger. And she went back before the sun rose. And she put the water into the kitchen. And then when it was the day of her wedding, and she was there in the church, and her husband-to-be was looking at her, and the people in the village had gathered, and they said, oh, look at this. Oh, what a beautiful bride. And she had the wedding dress on. But when it came time to put her wedding ring on, it wouldn't go on her finger. And why, the priest had looked down and said, wait, look, there's something there already. There's some sort of pagan charm. There's already a ring there. And suddenly, when the priest had said that, she remembered. And the woodcutter's daughter hollered out, my fawn! And suddenly, the fawn appeared at the church door. And she said, save me! And he said, I can't. You've got to come to me. So she tried to run. But the people in the church were grabbing her. And the priest was grabbing her dress. And she was running and pushing. And she got through the crowd of people, but they had torn all her clothes off. And when she got outside and she grabbed the fawn's hand, and they started to run, and she kicked off her shoes. And for years and years after, the people in the village said, what an awful thing. That horrible creature from the forest stole that beautiful girl. But there were farmers out working in the fields. And when they looked up, they saw two of the woodland creatures laughing and running deep into the forest. And they said, it was the most beautiful thing they had ever seen. The Fawn and the Woodcutter's Daughter, Barbara Leona Picard. So I have gone out. Today is National Record Store, Independent Record Store Day. And I picked up a couple of these old records that I have. Now, Vance Gilbert, he is a great folk singer. And Vance, I found this old album of his. He's got such a good sense of humor. Now, Vance, I had seen him at Salem at a uh, coffee house that was there that they had at the Universalist Church. And I run up before he does his encore and I say, Vance, this is for you. And I gave him a silver dollar. And I said, it's just, you know, it's a big thank you from your fans in Salem. And my buddy John was on the back on the soundboard, but he had a microphone there. And Vance goes, what? And all of a sudden you hear a voice over the speakers. Vance, it's a Unitarian Universalist sign of affection. And Vance looks up and says, who said that? And John goes, it's me, Vance, God. And without missing a beat, Vance says, damn, I was hoping God didn't sound like a 45-year-old white guy. <laughs> and this record, I had Christine Lavin, who was a magnificent folk singer, and all these folk singers are friends with each other, so I was just sparked to go ahead and have her sign it, even though it's not her record. She wasn't on it. And she wrote, Vance think he hot, he not. <laughs> and when I showed that to Vance, the next time I saw him, he said, Tony, where'd you get this relic? Christine, that is. <laughs> and this one, Ann Hills, when I was driving from Ohio, I was listening to the radio, and it was in 1987 when I was moving out here. She's got a song called Two of a Kind, and it was just about being lonely and traveling around and the folk singer. And I thought, that song is me coming to Boston. And I just loved it. And then I was able to see her at the Summerfest. Well, now it's called New Bedford Folk Festival. It's on the weekend after the 4th of July. And she was able to sign that. And I think with the albums and just playing with these, you find different things. When I go up and I talk to one woman, Chris Williamson, she had an album called Prairie Fire. And on that album, she was wearing a leather jacket that had fringe. And she asked me, do you know what fringe does? And I said, just looks pretty. She goes, it does that. But when you're riding a horse out in the prairie in the rain, the fringe wicks the water off so you don't get as wet. 
And I said, I never knew that. And she said, my father killed this elk and he tanned the hide himself and he made the jacket for me. And she said, when I had that picture taken, that was the last time that I would ever fit into that jacket. <laughs> but she said, I'll never throw it away. I have it in my closet now. And I looked through all the liner notes on the, the LP and there was nothing there that said anything about that at all. So I think I like to go ahead for the folk musicians that I so admire to go up and have them sign something and you have fun and it's just that little thing that makes me happy. So today, when you're done with this, I know Newberry Comics, they have all sorts of little free CDs and pint glasses and stuff to celebrate Independent Record Store Day. So when you go in, you can celebrate the Independent Record Store Day, but also you can secretly say a haiku as you're getting all your good swag there because it's National Poetry Month. Thank you. <laughs>
and the shape is ridged, cylindrical, a squashed chef's hat. And the seed is true. It does not mix, plant it. And you get more pure sweet, not too, and stringless. And cull the drying stem from the prickly vine and draw the knife, a circle around the stem, tug the top, and scoop the flat, moist seeds and spare, ropey pulp, and place the lid before baking the beast an hour, 400 degrees, and the, roast, and the roasted brown skin collapses into itself, and the clear, golden juice spills fills the pan sweet, fresh, nourishing milk. And dig up the baked squash, contain it, squeezing the remaining juice. And put it up to freeze until ready to make pies. And thaw to bake, expunging more juice to drink. And roll the dough flat on marble to keep it cool and fill the pans with rolled dough and beet filling, and bake in a hot oven short to brown and lower the temperature until done, and knife test the brown custard until it holds a cut, and remove, let cool and slice, and taste the pie wedge and Ooh, and tell everyone who will listen of the meat of the story of the pure strain.